thank you everyone for joining this conversation. Um, it's quite interesting and quite confounding, not just to me, but I think to an awful lot of people. Um, AI has been clearly been in the news. We'll talk a little bit about uh, some relatively recent uh, decisions by the administration that will affect AI, or at least we think. But I thought we'd start first by just having a brief introduction from each of you. Um, Edward, if you could go first. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Edward Guinness. I'm the co-founder of OpenPlay, uh, a music startup that uh, focuses on innovation on the, with respect to the dis distribution and rights management side and content management side of our industry. Uh, we've been very much involved with a lot of the technological shifts that we see in the industry today um, and across the entire entertainment sector. And um, the, this is a topic that's really apropos for, for what we're dealing with today. Great. Doran? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Doran Fagelson and I'm an engagement manager with the data art media and entertainment practice. So um, my role is really to try to partner with our clients um, and try to, try to understand how we can help them to achieve their business objectives with all kinds of technological services and business domain expertise. Um, and uh, as you know, you can imagine as a technology firm, we're very focused on potential of AI, uh, both to enhance and disrupt um, how and what our clients do um, with their businesses. So we're very much engaged in this space and very uh, keen to continue to um, put our best foot forward with helping clients to achieve goals with AI. Kevin? I'm Kevin. Uh, I advise data, art, media, and entertainment, but Prior to that, I come from a, a background in the music business, having worked at Sony, Universal, um, and Warners, um, mostly on the label side and in the distribution and the commerce side. So any conversation with technology is important and uh, I am interested in because it's kind of the evolution of my career. You know, as, as we sat in the labels, every time there was a new technology, there was an opportunity uh, and then there was anxiety. Um, so this topic in particular, uh, as it's across the news, I'm interested on both sides of that. And I'm Paul Slavin. At present, I'm an investment banker with Oakland's De Silva Phillips. Uh, prior to that, I was the CEO of a publishing company. Before that, I was the chief operating officer at Everyday Health, where technology and its impact, not so much AI, but the general changes in technology were terrifically important. And before that, I worked at Disney, where um, the business felt like it was routinely being disrupted by technology. Um, I can't imagine what they are now doing with AI, given the track record they had with technology when I was there. Um, but let's start with uh, what I hope will be a simple and a positive uh, question. What to each of you, and, and Edward, let's start with you, and then we'll work down the list. What, what are you most excited about this technology? Not what is the threat, but or your concerns, but what's most exciting about it? Well, you know, there are a lot of things to be excited about. Uh, I think, the, the, to me, the most profound impact with AI that I've seen to date, and, and we've been watching AI evolve for years now. This is not something that, you know, turned up all of a sudden a few months ago, uh, just like the media has portrayed. This has been a, an ongoing effort. And it, it used to be called machine learning. It used to be also an evolution when it comes to automation back when it really started to take form. Uh, for me, the evolution of AI has really culminated less in the creative aspects, which is what a lot of the focus is right now, but more on the automation of things, the ability for us to start getting humans that are no longer necessary in the process of analyzing or assessing, evaluating. Uh, these are the things that AI does better than humans. You know, it, it is more analytical, more effective in, in how it approaches problem solving. Um, so for me, the evolution of AI really is how do we get more people to do the things they want to do instead of the work that they're doing? And I think AI is going to allow for that. And do you see uh, within your business, Edward, are you utilizing AI now or machine learning or? It's a great question. We're doing exactly as I just mentioned with our own business. We are focused on the automation side of AI. Uh, the, the, the trepidation in our industry and across entertainment around the creative uses of AI are going to be playing out for a long time. 
where we see the benefit of AI are things as simple as automatically translating all of your metadata into 240 languages, automatically creating a, a, a suggested list of hits for your next playlist based on all this billions of records of data that no human can really sift through elegantly. These are the elements that we are employing. Things like detecting a barcode on a cover image automatically so it doesn't get uh, uh, rejected later uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a retailer environment. Um, so again, as we sit and watch the evolution, we are implementing AI in the areas we think will be the least controversial at the moment. Okay, Doron, same question. Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, I have to concur with what Edward started with, which is that it's very hard to not be excited about many different areas of this technology. Um, I, I think that um, one thing that seems to me in the media space to be um, particularly exciting and I, I think could be a big game changer is really where, um, if you think about where AI algorithms have had a lot of impact um, up until now, anyway, the, the high have much more choice with AI algorithms, but actually in practice, that often wasn't the case. It often actually limited our, our options um, because often systems were being built to sort of, you know, serve up what these systems thought we would like to see. So for example, you know, uh, on YouTube, you would be served up certain videos that algorithms would assume you would want to see or post on social media that the algorithms would think would be interesting to you. And I think that actually served sort of to uh, perhaps um, Make, make people less curious or make people lazier. And now what I see with particularly generative AI is um, I think that there, there's so much potential um, new, new, new options, different answers. If you go to a chatbot and you ask it for say, you know, give me three headlines for this particular article. And then you ask the same question a second time, you'll get a different set of answers from the first time. And I think it's forcing us to really be a little bit more thoughtful and discerning about the the information and the, the media we consume. Um, and so I think that that's going to get away from the pattern of uh, uh, information sort of being controlled by other parties and being funneled through um, certain channels. Um, and I'm excited about just kind of the opportunities there um, to, to change, I think, how people have um, been really interacting with AI algorithms in the past. Cool. Thank you. Kevin? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a, both sides of this. I think on the analytics side of AI, it's exciting because there's been so much, so many areas where, you know, especially sitting in a label seat where, if, you know, tools that you can be enhanced that are powered by AI can make your decisions in real time and faster. And especially in the copyright area where that has been such an area of contention over the years and mystery of all the splits and and who owns what. And if there are systems that can help in that, uh, that will be huge. But then on the creative side, uh, I also find it really exciting because where it's also thorny because of fakes and all that. But if you just focus on just in the studio and the creative side of some of the tools that we've seen over the years um, and what, you know, I just saw you two in the sphere. You know, there's a lot of AI technology being used not only in the music side, that new music, yeah but in the artistic side of that. Uh, and, and that's just, for an artist, it can be scary that there's AI tools, but the ones that are gonna embrace it are gonna make incredible new music and kind of blow our brains down the road. So I would, I would agree with the three of you on the positive side. This is a powerful tool, but it is a tool. And it is a tool which will be in the hands of people who presumably understand how to use it. and like any tool from the spinning wheel to the automobile, you know, it can, it can be a problem, but it's only a problem if we allow it to be a problem. Um, now, I work with publishing companies and they are absolutely um, freaked out about AI. Um, but my experience publishing companies are, you know, any new technology is, keeps them up late at night, but this one is, is particularly challenging for them. So let me take the opposite side of the question and start again with Edward. Uh, what keeps you up at night over AI and the media space? What, what, what is your what is your concern? I mean, besides autonomous robots that eliminate human beings, 
um, sticking closer to the media landscape. But what do you see as a concern? Well, look, I, I think what Kevin said earlier is interesting about the term embrace. I, I think the term is embrace, not replace. And I think this is where the fear factor that the really is plaguing the, the industry is that replacement is about to happen. That we are about to replace our writers, our songwriters, our performers with just generative AI that will be consumed to the same degree by by audiences with no care for the you know the creator behind it. Right, that that's the ultimate fear of the industry is that this is taking away from, um, and you know it's comp compounded with where is it taking that from? Right, is it built on the backs of all of the other content that's been created up to this point, which is what AI is consuming to create these generative elements? It's not just doing it in a vacuum; it's consuming all of the world's knowledge and producing what we're seeing. Um, the, the, you know, for me, the, 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 the view here is um, when autotune came out, right? It's, it freaked people out from the perspective of music is now dead. Anyone can sing. No longer do you have to be talented to have, you know, a voice. Well, that did not prove to be the end of musicians as we know it, the end of artists as we know it. It, you know, separated and created a cleaner list of, a sound in some cases and a much worse sound in other cases. And it came down to how the tools were actually being used. And I think AI is going to fall into this category. I think we're, we're absolutely going to see some incredible tools, especially when it comes to enhancing existing audio or automating some of the process of, let's say, creating a music video that an artist that struggles with getting this content out the door. I think there's a lot of opportunity, um, but that opportunity is what is driving this fear because if this technology can take my piece of audio and tune it the way that an engineer could, I no longer need that engineer. So, you know, what happens to that engineer is an ongoing question and concern that I think we have, um, you know, been battling with as this comes around. Uh, but again, with all things, my biggest fear of all of this is actually noise and garbage at scales we have yet to have seen in the space. We're going to be flooded with the most automated, just mundane music and not just music, news articles and everything else that's out there, you're going to start seeing a huge amount of just generative AI content that is just going to feel like everything else. It's going to feel mundane and flat without any life or character, which is what often is what plagues AI versus what human capital can bring. And that's really my concern. So interestingly, your, your concern is not that AI is going to devastate the industry or take over the world. It's that it's, it's just going to be mediocrity to the nth power that's correct yeah i think i think a lot of kind of the artist community share that as well right you know there's a lot of artists that are out there thinking is a robot you know can these companies that have millions of tracks of what they call proprietary music beds you know if you can create a proprietary music track with one of these boomies or sound tooth or one of these platforms how fast are you going to be able to produce something that maybe by a human pressing the button makes it a copyrighted material? Let's say, you know, it's not, you're not using someone else's copyright. Are you going to flood the market with, to, to Ed's point, just about a crappy music? Um, if you're an artist, there's already a hundred thousand tracks being put up on Spotify a day, right? So now you're competing with robots for your share of the year, for your share of, of what you believe in your core is your artistic, you know, that's your, that's your life. And somebody's creating something at light speed and putting it up there. Um, you know, so that, so an artist is probably concerned about that. And the labels, I think, and everyone in the, in the industry, like to your point, Paul, with the publishers, anyone that owns a copyrighted catalog, you want to make sure that your copyrighted material is, what is the machines learning on? Because once that material gets, copyright material gets into an AI system, you know, there goes all your splits and all your back end. And that's where you really, I think a lot of the label side people are embracing technology, but they're scared of that. They're, they're scared of their copyrighted material being lost in this world. And, and, you and, and I think that's, that, 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 I think that's, that's, that's exactly the fear. And I think a lot of it is just not understanding how these lang large language models work. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've seen this as I've worked with companies like data art, you know, with a few of our customers, the, the concerns that we have see is that you're going to take all of my 
internal data that I've been collating and competing on for the last 30 years, and you're going to process it, and you're going to make it so that my competitors can now use that to train their own models to compete against us. That, that's the fear. Not understanding that's that data can be bifurcated, right? You can have the world of the internet in one bucket and then your own private content in the other bucket and never the two shall meet. And the, 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 the trainings can be used from one to only benefit the one and not the other, right? This is, this is what people are confusing is that somehow AI is open source. That is not the case. AI data mm -hmm. is not open source. It doesn't feed everything that you do back to a mothership based on you know, the data that you are working with. Um, and I think this is something that the industry as a whole, technology as well, is going to have to make it clear. And it's gonna be a long education, years of education that your data, just like when the cloud came about, right? Everybody thought, oh my God, my content is now available to everybody to download. Little did they realize that that was just co-location facilities renamed to something else, right? And I think we are, again, seeing that initial trepidation. And I think we're gonna see more of that until the technology is really much better understood. Before we go to Doron, let me just ask, that's a terrific um, comparison with the cloud. Cause I remember when the cloud came out, and big media companies in particular were, were very concerned that stuff would go into the cloud and everybody was gonna get access to it and all of their secrets were gonna get taken. Um, would you say that's a direct comparison? In terms I would of say it's not a, people yeah, have? I would, I would, I would, the, the only reason it's not a direct comparison is before the cloud, when the cloud migrations were happening, the fear actually lived mostly in both the boardroom and the IT walls. Nowhere in between. The creatives were never worried about the cloud, right? It was never, never a fear. Now everyone is involved, right? Now it's the creative seeing that their livelihood could be displaced, the boardroom fearful that their financials are now going to be built on the backs, backs of their competitors. And now you have the IT team saying, whoa, this is moving far faster than we understand it to be. So let's slow everything down by a few years before we make any decisions. That's that's kind of the lay of the land that I've been seeing very clearly. Yeah. And Doran? Yeah, I, I, I think that both Kevin and Edward have raised some really great points um, and pointed to some really important concerns. Yeah. And, you know, I do think that a lot of it really does come back to data. And I think, you know, being focused on the potential threat to jobs is really the wrong focus here. I think that the dangers very, very much come back to how are we using the data that goes into these systems and how are we protecting personal data and how are we also um, trying to compensate the use of copyrighted work in, in, in those, in those um, tools and platforms. Um, I know, for example, you know, to go back to the publishing industry where you come from, Paul, um, that there was a report earlier this year by the Financial Times, um, which was focused on how media groups are in talks with the major AI platforms to really be compensated for the use of all their content in training these very large language models. And um, without that compensation, without that protection of their IP, um, they, they, they can look at it as an existential threat to their business, right? So we have to figure out a way to ensure that I think intellectual property and the the, the content that is copyrighted and that those um, copyright owners, uh, you know, lawfully and, and understandably are entitled to be uh, compensated for, um, that, that somehow there's a, a, a way to do that, that uh, uh, benefits both parties, right? And continues to um, allow innovation to take place. Um, and there are, I mean, there've been some initiatives that uh, are already, I think, underway um, to help address some of these issues. So I, I know that, for example, um, there's this initiative called the Content Authenticity Initiative. And um, this is really about trying to provide much more transparency and um, insight into provenance of generative content. Uh, and it kind of works by applying um, cryptographic uh, um, cryptographic, so signatures on, on material as well as um, labeling materials so that you can really see who the authors were, where did that content come from, how many versions and edits have been made on it, so that anyone who kind of looks at content that has come through this CAI process will really be able to understand the provenance of that information better. 
And we don't really have that kind of visibility uh, extensively right now in a lot of generative content. And I think until we do, people are going to be rightfully concerned um, that uh, uh, these systems are taking advantage of copyright and there's not enough visibility into um, content. It's making it very difficult to distinguish what is generative versus what is authentic content. That's a big problem. That's a terrific point. Um, just to go back to something that uh, Edward started with and you guys all reflected on, uh, homogeneity and mediocrity have certainly been a feature of the big media landscape well before AI ever came along. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I, I would agree with you that I'm not deeply concerned about that. Um, that'll happen whether AI is doing it or not. Um, but Doron, you make a really powerful point about utilizing this as actually the opposite of what some people are fearing, that utilize it to reflect on or talk about deep fakes or talk about you know, being able to identify things that have been manipulated. I've noticed, um, particularly in this most recent um, uh, series of things that have happened in the Middle East, the amount of video out there, which is fake, um, but really pretty darn good fakes, unless you happen to know the specific video game it was lifted out of, or if you understand that this particular plane is not there, if you don't walk into it with some level of intelligence, it's really, really hard to know. And to be able to turn an AI tool onto that to, to help identify what's real and what's not real is, you know, will be very powerful. It'll be kind of, a, I guess, a metaphorical arms war between the fakers and the, and the truth tellers. What do you guys think about what, what, that? I think it'll never work. Uh, I, I, I think these content initiatives, these approaches to, you know, AI okay, these, they're, they're basically becoming self uh, admission, right? At that point, you're either saying I use AI or I don't as a self-admission. Anything short of that will just be completely nullified by slightly better technology tomorrow and the next day and the next day. The the ability for us to be able to determine the provenance of, of, a, of a piece of content is not something that I think we should be chasing. I think it's just not something that's feasible to any real degree. And look, we can't even get the provenance of ownership on things like film that we know did not generate from AI and where those pieces came from and who owns what. Like we're, we're the, 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 the way that the technology is evolving, the way that it's, it's moving, um, you know, the, the whole knowledge of the internet is on the table. So if it's been out on the wild before, assume some language model has already indexed it and collated it into its, 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 uh, its, its technology space. It, doesn't know the difference between uh, any one of those elements being different than the other. It's generating from each one of them. To trace that back to the underlying roots, I mean, sure, there are companies that will invest in this, and there'll be investors who invest in those companies, but I think they'll lose this battle at the end of the day. For an AI technology, much like the Turing test was quickly beaten by the modern-day chat GPT, the next evolution is going to quickly outpace what their AI itself can detect whether it is AI or not. I think this is, um, you know, we're now in the realm of the philosophical than we are in the realm of actual technology really being valuable. So unless someone pl proudly states, I used AI here and here, and I used a real performer here and here, I just do not see technology winning, you know, uh, losing this battle of identification. You guys, what do you think about that? Well, well you know, it's funny, we, we were kind of talking off camera about you know, the new kind of executive order coming from the White House. One of the things that is in that order is that you, about a watermarking of, of, of content to identify it as this was used with AI, you know, in the, in the effort that they assume that they're going to be tamping down on deep fakes, you know, so you say, you know, so this, this is created with AI you know, so that people would get the, the consumer would say, oh, this is not real. So, Ed, you're saying that's just impossible to put a, a lid I just on that think that, that it'll be an ongoing arms race for, for decades right. to come. I, I do not think that this is going to be a uh, easy win for the administration or anyone else who thinks that legislation is going to solve any of these problems. Just like right. legislation didn't necessarily solve even the pirating problems we saw in our space, right? Sure, the enforcement was was fearful at times, but it was technology that actually made us move away from that peer-to-peer -peer pirating model because it got cheaper 
and it got easier. And as things get cheaper and easier, right. people try not to go out of their way to go and avoid those situations because it's just not worth the effort. Uh, but I do think when it comes to uh, content and IP ownership, just like with everything else, if you publish lyrics and they're picked up by Music Match or Lyric Find and they're out in the internet and they're, they're published lyrics, I fully believe that AI should be able to know that this is published content, that this is own content. And if somebody asks me to play the lyrics to, you know, hello, I want it to be authentic and I want them, the publisher, to get paid for playing those lyrics. If I ask it to create me a compilation that I decide based on these five songs that I want you to think about, I just don't know how that end result compilation, that derivative, of the you know the influence of five different artists mm -hmm. coming together into a new song can easily be traced back to which of those five songs that inspiration came from. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I I was going to say I, I think that um, perhaps you know full traceability with full provenance for every single piece of you know AI generated content uh, today and going forward, however many decades is 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 probably going to be a big lift and is probably perhaps you know beyond what we can expect. But I think, you know, it, 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 it's perhaps more important to uh, address, you know, one of the concerns you raised, Edward, which is that without being able to distinguish what is, you know, truly authentic from something that is just generated by AI, we will find ourselves flooded with um, all kinds of fake and misinformation, um, and we'll find it very difficult to distinguish um, what's real from what isn't. Um, and we need to find a way using technology to uh, be able to make those distinctions. So perhaps we need to set the bar a bit lower and perhaps it should be really about, you know, in what situations do we need to know whether something is um, authentic versus uh, generative? Um, and then, you know, in what cases does it affect the issue of copyright and, and IP and, and compensation um, and focus on those? Well, it's yeah, funny, uh, the, the battle between humans and AI has actually been going on for years, and we've all been party to it, as every time we use a CAPTCHA on a website to put in information to identify that I am a human, those have gotten more evolved, as you know, all of you over mm. the years, because computers and AI have been being used to basically fake being a human. So it's getting more evolved because we have been gamifying and figuring out how to pretend to be better humans. I think the same exact thing is going to happen in the AI front. It's going to be a battle between how much humanity can we instill into faking or into AI. Yeah, you speak about the lyric. Go ahead, Kevin. Oh, yeah, just, just forgive me. So the, just thinking about the lyric again you know, how the major, you know, music companies are embracing AI on one foot, right? But then all of a sudden, where they get nervous again is with Anthropic, you know, there's a big, they think there's an infringement of their lyrics being used on their platform and Universal and all the publishers are now suing them, you know, uh, where probably it two weeks ago, uh, they were I, embracing it. all the sense, but, but it just, look at the timing. It happened right after right. multiple billions of dollars were placed into that company by Amazon. No one cared exactly. until there was billions of dollars pummeled in to that organization. This is interesting. Go ahead, Paul. But, Sorry. But, but just, yeah. but this industry has a has a, a way of you know real be, being really upset once there's money, right? It's it's there's there's a lot of a, a lot of fear at first, but when it really gets upset is when there's a lot of money involved. Well, particularly when it's coming from really big tech like Amazon or Google right. or somebody. Because uh, that that just stokes people's fears, but it's also an interesting question for you guys. <clears throat> so again, to go back to this specific publishing company, and it's a book publishing company I'm working for. They're not small, but you know they can barely get TVs to turn on, and they're still using TVs with cathode rays in them. So now AI is rolling along, and they're they're just really really concerned not only about it from a policy perspective, but they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to build it. They don't have IT teams or tech teams or CTOs that work with it. If you're most companies, if you're not Google, if you're not data art, but you're, uh, you know, this company does about $800 million in revenue, so they're not small, what do they do? How do they, how do they think about it? Again, not from a policy point of view, but how do they 
get into it or don't get into it? Do they offshore it? Do they, you know, what do they do? I mean, they're basically, I'll show you exactly what some of them are doing. Right. So what do you guys suggest that they do? Well, uh, you know, I, I think that just like with all things, if they wait, it'll just become the end faster. Right. They all like, like all things. We, you have to be mindful of what technology is do, doing and how it can disrupt. And unfortunately, that's going to require some shift in their leadership teams in these organizations that that haven't evolved in law in a long time, because as much as you can outsource, it doesn't ever really work unless you have the right internal stakeholders that understand what it is that they're outsourcing, what it is that they're looking to get created to evolve in the field. So, so you know, if I was at an organization, I would start looking internally at leadership, look at the CTO and see, you know, is this the right fit for a 2023, 2024 era CTO? And it starts there, someone who understands where the publishing business is, where it needs to go, how to embrace some of these technologies that would take the content and all that learn dynamics that this company has had for a long, long time and shape that into the next set of products, whether they're digital products that are using AI to create new content that's now generative based on existing IP that it can make, make more interactive, for example. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities, I think, in publishing to make reading even more impactful, make it even more interactive, make it more user-driven which I think you know, some publishers are going to figure out. Many won't, and many will not survive. Even no matter how much revenue they bring in today, that has no bearing on where they'll be a decade from now. You know, we all thought Kodak will be the predominant leader in our space one day, but it wasn't. And you know, and it, and and that's because evolution of tech internally did not provide the right air cover and bring in the right people to do this type of evolution. Dora. Well, I, I would say that it, it, it should come back, you know, to essentially, you know, what are the main objectives, business objectives and problems that any company is trying to solve? And, you know, to what extent does AI technologies offer uh, a way to solve those problems? And so I think it's always a case by case basis. Um, you know, I think that it doesn't necessarily have to mean that that particular company needs to go through a huge digital transformation, there might be incremental enhancements to the way that they do their business that can be very valuable here. Um, you know, you, you could you could employ chat GBT in ways that um, could, you know, help brainstorming that can uh, help, you know, editors if they're trying to, um, you know, come up with different formats for different audiences very quickly and to, you know, create summaries of certain um, articles easily. Um, I, I think there's there's lots of small things that can be done. Um, again, depending on what is the uh, main challenges for them, what are the main problems they're trying to solve for, it may not you know need a uh, a, a huge uh, kind of digital transformation necessarily. It depends where they are. Um, they can certainly partner with technology companies that have expertise in that. Um, I mean, as, as a technology company, we're positioning ourselves for helping clients of all shapes and sizes um, with a, you know, an AI competency center. Um, we can do a lot of AI consulting. We, we can, you know, help clients to understand what are the risks to their business, um, where are the opportunities. Um, so uh, you don't have to outsource it completely, but it can certainly be done in partnership with um, experts who really know about the space better and can advise. I would look at it that way. But does does your company, for instance, offer something beyond tech folks who can actually build it to people who can actually say, here's what it should look like? And almost like you had a, you know, a, a, we, a, a fractional CTO? Well, I, I mean, we, we can help at lots of different levels. Um, I mean, at the moment, one of the things that we've really been focused on actually is um, working on various POCs, proof of concepts, which are, um, you know, essentially kind of small projects, um, small kind of MVPs um, in which, you know, we're willing to make investments with, with, our, with our client partners in um, because we think it's important that uh, our clients experiment with opportunities and um, that we also build our own expertise there. Um, but, you know, there's other questions on things like AI governance and, and scalability and, um, uh, you know, all kinds of um, issues of, 
of privacy of data um, and where is that data being shared if they're using large language models in their solutions. So um, I think at you know, different levels, um, we're positioned to help and uh, we can continue to provide those services. Kevin? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer that the road to transformation is one of requiring vision, education, and innovation. And, and I think I think all three of those require some internal stakeholders to understand one or three of those elements. Because when you outsource a problem, you have to understand what the solution you're going to get is going to provide, right? A lot of the disconnect between service providers and those clients hiring those service providers is oftentimes when the solution is presented, they don't quite know whether this is the solution, whether it's the right solution, whether it's the solution I asked for and was I asking for the right solution in the first place. And I think, again, where we see the best combination between transformative organizations or organizations like Data Art that help transform and those customers that they transform is that someone understands the mission, understands the problem, understands why they're doing this in the first place. Because if you're just approaching outsourcing your work like an OKR exercise, you have already failed in that endeavor. It, this is not a, we're just solving these checklists of business problems, let's outsource this. In this world of evolution, and especially with AI, you have to grasp it, understand it, embrace it, and you can discount it later, but you have to first understand it before you can discount it of whether it makes sense for your organization or not. So that makes great sense, and I've certainly seen many, many organizations fail because they do exactly what you were saying, be careful of. Yeah. Um, but so, Kevin, you're out in the real world, and you guys are talking about this. So what, do you advise, what do you advise somebody to do? We, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of picking up on everything these guys are saying is I think a lot of the situations we come into, some people are stuck in the moment, right? Not to, not to quote you two again, but, uh, you know, so they're stuck in their problem of the moment. And a lot of times, like what we're seeing now with AI, it's almost like been there, done that, seen that, you know, it, you know, whether it was with Napster or streaming or downloads or anything with music, it's the same thing with publishing. Sometimes you have to kind of, look back to look ahead and say, let's not just build a huge new system to solve this problem because this, there's, there's going to be another one down the road. So bringing in industry expertise, like when we, when we have these data art conversations, you have the technology folks that it can see, have seen other industries or maybe worked across other industries or technologies where they can say, okay, we can solve this problem today, but what does it look like five years from now? Cause there's going to be another, there's another, AI coming or last year everyone was freaking out about NFTs, right? So do we need to hire a bunch of NFT people and build a whole system around NFTs? Well, maybe not. Maybe that's just a piece of the pie of what we need to build as another opportunity. All right, well, uh, to get super practical again, so you walk into, um, again, like, let's say the company that I'm, I'm working with on another thing and they don't have a CTO. Uh, they have what's they still call an IT department, and that IT department hands out computers and you know sets up television sets. But they're hearing about AI; they're scared of AI. Um, it doesn't seem to be immediately relevant to them, other than just a threat. You walk in the door, and you guys say what to them? You know, I I, I don't you know echo. It would say a few moments ago too, too, too much, but I, I think that, um, uh, it, it, you know, sometimes we're in situations where we'll, we'll have an opportunity with the prospects and after a couple of rounds of conversation, we find out they don't have a, a full-time CTO, for example, and they're very ambitious goals and very, you know, uh, uh, interesting ideas. But if they don't have the right people on their side as a stakeholder to really understand what they're looking to do, and be able to hire the right people to support that and be able to kind of create the vision with us to help them. We can't, and we don't want to do that for them because, you know, we, we want to make sure that this is ultimately going to be successful for them and that at a certain point we can hand off, you know, the project to them. They're always going to own the IP um, is, is, is the way we approach these things. Um, so one of those things might be being honest with them and saying, you know, get get the product owner that you're missing or the CTO that you don't have right now. Um, and then we can 
have a, a real conversation um, about how to help. That's that's so, by the way, what what in my opinion, what differentiates data art from every other player I've seen in the space, because everyone else's answer to that question was absolutely. Sure, we will architect and build your house and tell you how to use it, right? Uh, but the answer, reality, the, 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 what, what Doran said was very critical, and people don't realize this. When you hire a team to build something, you have to expect that you're going to be handed the keys one day, and you need to be able to know what to do with those keys. And a lot of these organizations, they don't know what to do with these keys. And this is where every, all that effort, all that money spent can go down the drain faster and people realize when you hand off the keys and that technology stops working a month later, a year later, it's just gone, gone to waste. And that oftentimes is done in organizations where there is no product owner. There is no CTO or even an advisor, right? I wouldn't say you don't need a, you don't even need to CTO at this stage. Get a really good advisor. Someone understands the challenges that the space and, and they don't need to be a fractional CTO. That, I think those titles are starting to become a thing of the past, right? It's it's do, which areas are you looking to evolve and do you have the right advisors in those specific areas? Because it's too wide to be a CTO these days. There are too many areas to be involved with. You have to be a functional subject matter expert in those areas to be valuable. Otherwise, you're just yet another CTO that's hiring a McKinsey or someone else to come in and do your work for you. And that doesn't work either. So I think that, again, uh, in, in your situation, Paul, my advice to that organization would be to find a rock star advisor that knows the space, knows where the evolution is, and has some passion behind that solution. Because, you know, my, my litmus test for advisors is how much passion they have about the areas they're advising in. And if there is no passion there, if they're not, if they, if they don't have a, a feverish position on something in that space, whether it's good or bad, then they're really not great advisors. That's great. Kevin, thoughts? Uh, you know, it's um, it, it actually reminds me of something Duran and I worked on, you know, where we had the dreamer, the, you know, the, the, uh, the visionary entrepreneur that has a great vision, right? A great plan. More and a dreamer than a visionary, I would say. <laughs> the dreamer, right. Yeah. But, um, but until you land, the, until he got the right, tech advisor and the whole roadmap completely changed, right? You know, we, we really steered him towards, let's continue this conversation. The dream is good, but we can only help you so far. And then when the right advisor came in to change, the conversation completely changed because the person had some experience in building product and, um, and the dream, I think the dream changed and, and it could become a reality, but it was based on seeking help with someone with real technical chops, where where the where the CTO or the CEO or the guy that has a vision can keep dreaming, and then he builds a team to kind of steer the ship, and that's when that's when da a company like Data Art can become really valuable once they have that person that they can work with, collaborate with, and you know build something that the dreamer will eventually go, oh, wow, this is, yeah. I guess, what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, and I, my only advice for that would be to start that process as early as possible. You don't want to be yes. halfway through what you thought you wanted to build and then hire a dreamer or a visionary, right? You don't right. want to be standing in the middle of a construction yard now drawing up architectural plans, right? So, so those yes. are the thoughts that I would have. Yeah. And I think the distinction you're making also, Kevin, is the importance of, you know, having someone alongside that visionary dreamer who can be a decision maker in the yes. technical space. Right. Just and, um, to, to, to the budgets, to the roadmap, to, right. to you know, what you're with yeah. the reality. And, and you know, also say maybe you just need to buy some product to start. Maybe you don't need to invest in building right, right. now, but then you can build something custom as you get going. Right. So, well, just Go one ahead, last Mark. thing there, sorry, Paul. I was just going to say, I, I mean, oftentimes we'll, you know, we'll feel really good about partnering with a client and being able to actually offer different approaches, different, you know, options to a particular solution and look at different, you know, technologies, uh, uh, do, do assessments of, of, of different technologies and um, d different technical approaches. But we don't want to be the, the, the actual decision maker because at the end of the day, it's the client that's going to own it in the long run, right? right? And so the client is going to be left with that product. So 
they should be the ones responsible for making all those key decisions along the way. And we're just doing, we're just being, you know, our, our, our best advisory, our best consulting selves um, in that process. But if they don't have that person who can really call those decisions and, um, uh, and, and, you know, keep, keep things sort of driven, right. And, and follow a certain process, uh, it makes it very difficult for us, and um, we we always want to be successful with those partnerships. Yeah, I look so, at the building anything, whether it's an AI or analytics or anything, uh, akin to launching a rocket into space. Um, the the complexity can be just as immense if you're looking at all the moving parts that require a successful launch of a transformation or a product inside of your organization. And the way I have talked about in the past, the groups like data art, you know, they're, I look at them as boosters as to those rockets. And those boosters are there to provide that initial horsepower, that initial acceleration into the market, into space. And then they fall off, they drop off, they should drop off so that the rest of the organization can continue to go forward. These boosters specifically are there to create early, early agility and allow us to get to market faster, transform faster. But if reliance on it is not to be long-term, otherwise your entire business will you know, have to consist, work within those controls. So I think it's, it's really a matter of knowing how to use organizations like data art for that agility and be able to take control of it once that booster is no longer needed. So let me, let me ask you, uh, put you on the spot just a little bit, just in terms of but condensing this. So codify for me how how somebody goes about this. We certainly, there are sophisticated organizations that know pretty much what they want, but I'm, again, I work with company after company after company and they are not sophisticated. So if you were to present a, here's a three-step approach or 20-step approach, whatever, codify for me how somebody would approach this, this field outside of I'm terrified of it and it's gonna put my folks out of work. How do I go about thinking about it, entering it, et cetera? Edward, I'd like to hold you for last because I know you know how to. You'll answer this one, but so I'd like to. I'd like to start with Kevin and work my way back. <laughs> I, I think it's it, it's it's what's the end result, right? You know, what do what do we what do what are we what are we looking to solve? What's what's the problem, and what are we looking to solve? And in the case of AI, and let's just say you know, in, in pure analytics or as a power tool. There, there could be tools that a company needs that could be powered by AI um, or a, where you can bring in a company like Data Art and sit down <laughs> right around the table and say, okay, this is, this is, this is the problem. But you've identified your problem and here are some solutions, you know, using technology to get there. And then you bring in someone like Duran and his team where they can actually identify, you know, that end result or, or how they're going to get there. And I'll flip it to Duran now. Okay, Duran. Um, well, I, I, I know that um, very often if we come into a potential opportunity very early with a client, one of the things we always strongly recommend we do with them is a, uh, is essentially like a discovery phase that we call solution design. And the reason we do that is because we want to help our, our clients not only to kind of build the vision out further, um, but also to sort of really uh, understand what are the risks um, in, the, in, the, in the products or the um, solution they're trying to build, um, what are the particular uh, specific requirements for it, you know, what are some of the workflows involved and how do you understand those? And to try to take sort of like a holistic approach to what they're doing, because uh, it might be that they haven't fully understood the complexity of what they need to do. It might be that they aren't very good at estimating what it's going to cost um, and it's you know not realistic for them. Um, or it might be it's going to take a much longer time and it needs to be done iteratively. So I would always go back to this sort of principle of uh, recommending the solution design before embarking on implementation and development because you have to really know what that vision is going to be. You have to know what the risks are and how to mitigate for those risks. Um, and you want to be prepared very early on 
I think a lot of IT projects fail because you haven't done enough sort of preparatory work um, before you actually start the um, actual coding and development. Um, so that that would be sort of my uh, my suggestion in, in those situations. Thank you, Edward. Take it home. <laughs> yeah. So so look, I I, I think Doran's right. The, the a solution approach uh, certainly helps understand what needs to be built and how. But I think before that, I think you know to to, to your point, Paul, to codify this situation to the customers you deal with and the clients you deal with. Um, I think it comes down to uh, showing them what's possible first. I think the, the problem that most people lack is vision and understanding what's possible today before you even get to solutions, before you even get to their problems. I think a lot of organizations, because if you ask them their challenges, they'll tell you their challenges, but they not that those may not be the direct correlation to what the solution needs to look like. And a lot of that is due to, to not knowing what is out there today? A lot of these executives don't know what's possible. They don't know what AI can do for them yet. They they just know the, the, the buzzwords, the terminologies. I would say I would sit down with these guys and show them five cool things that are feasible today with a technology, whether it's AI or something similar. What is today feasible? And I would show them, whether it's industry specific to them or not, what's possible. And then have the conversation about how these possibilities of what's available today can potentially align into their organization, how they can use what this company in this other vertical has been doing that could transform what they're doing. Because if we don't start educating first as a primer, um, I just don't think that we're going to, by the time we get to solution design, we're either going to be spending a lot of time focusing in areas that aren't moving the industry or their vertical forward, or they end up building a solution to something, but that solution doesn't actually solve their underlying desires of what they really wanted out of this experience. So I, I do think education first is still the best way to sell any type of service to a customer. Well, this has been terrific. Um, I think we've used our time well. Um, I really appreciate everybody, the time, intelligence, and the thought. Um, and uh, I, I hope we get to do this again. I think this has been, certainly for me, it's been very, very helpful and I hope it, it served everybody's interest. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna sign off and everybody can go back to doing what they do. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.